You're listening to Life Repair Recovery Talk Radio with Rick Thompson only on L.A. Talk Radio. Good evening. Tonight's going to be a little different <laughs> because uh, my guest uh, went to the wrong address. I don't know how that happened, but it happened. And so it's me and you. And so I'm just literally pulling stuff out of my file and I'm just going to start talking about, well, the most common problem we have in America today with the youth is heroin addiction. And there is a friend of mine by the name of Kurt and his daughter, who will remain nameless, got sepsis from intravenous drug usage. And I'll explain what that is. Sepsis, excuse me or blood poisoning is a life-threatening condition whereby a large number of toxic bacterium are present in the bloodstream. This condition occurs when a person has an infected site such as an injecting point, large wound, or from some other conditions like a urinary tract disease. The infectious bacteria from the infection site enters the bloodstream and overcomes the body causing whole body inflammation. Without immediate and aggressive treatment, sepsis may develop into multiple organ dysfunction and intravenous drug users are at a high risk of developing sepsis due to the use of a dirty or infected needle that is either shared with someone else or reused. It can also occur when a drug user repeatedly injects into an inflamed and infected site or has already developed cellulitis. Sepsis may also be more likely to develop due to the poor overall health of the injecting drug user. This young girl, 20 years old, gorgeous, bright, not sure of the pattern from point A to point B of how she got where she is, but she was feeling horrific. We were in the process of putting her in treatment. She sends me a text, when can I go in? She goes off the radar screen for two hours. Her father calls me and says, she's in the emergency room She's now in ICU, and if she would have waited three more hours, the doctor had said to him she would be gone, as in dead. Next day, they find out that she's got a massive sepsis infestation throughout her body. That afternoon, they find out that she has, after the CAT scan, one of her heart valves is just completely infected. They have to open this girl up. They have to give her an open heart surgery. She's 20 years old. So they have to crack this kid's chest and go in and replace a heart valve with tissue. This was about three and a half weeks ago. What that does to any human body is unbelievable. I saw a photograph of her after, and she was like the size of a balloon. Because in addition to the area that they had to go in and replace, you know, it's all through her body. It's in her lungs. It's in her liver. So they have to clear her out. So they've run, they're running all these IV antibiotics through this girl. And she's still in the hospital, out of ICU. It's looking promising. But the day after they did the operation, they come in and they look at the girl and they say, we have to give you a pacemaker and you're going to have it the rest of your life. She's 20 years old. Because if she doesn't have the pacemaker, she did such damage to her heart by shooting drugs and the following sepsis that she has to have this for the rest of her existence. If she doesn't, she's dead. Her heart stops. You know, I I can't wrap my head around intravenous drug use. I never could. When I was a kid and I started in the concert business, there was a lot. I was smoking a lot of grass like everybody else was and drinking Heineken's and whatever. And I didn't even get into cocaine until 1981, so I was, you know, doing very harmless, seemingly harmless drugs at the time. And I watched these guys in these rock bands and the managers, you know, sit around in their expensive suits in the back of limousines, jacking dope into their veins, and literally open the door to the limo and just vomit. And I'm thinking, you know, that's not going to get you a date. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that was that was my rationale. It was all about getting girls, man. I mean, that was that was it. And you know, I'm thinking you're not getting a date, and it's gross. And I mean, I'm no good with a needle. I mean, every time they take my blood, I pass out. I'm like a total puss. Thank God, that's a gift. That is a complete gift and a lifesaver for me, because I could never wrap my head around injecting 
anything into my veins that didn't belong there, one, or putting a metal spike into my flesh, cognizantly trying to get high. Maybe I just wasn't in that much pain, as much pain as I thought. To reduce the risk of sepsis, which has many, scarring of the veins is common, collapsed veins and abscessing of arteries and injection spots are often reported issues. Ulcers, cellulitis, tetanitis, sepsemia, and thrombosis are all very real complications of injecting drugs along with the potential risks of injecting toxic and harmful adulterant substances. Well, unsanitary conditions, sharing of needles and equipment, blunt needles and dirty water all contribute to disease and infection. Intravenous drug users can reduce the risk of developing sepsis or other infections by ensuring that they use a new and clean needle every time they inject or just not do it. Just a thought. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Maybe just too simple for some people to wrap their heads around. Don't put the spike and the dope in your arm. Okay. Treating any infections or sores on the body correctly, always using a clean injecting point and sterilizing the site of the infection, excuse me, injection every time. If an addict is suffering from any health problems related to injecting drug use, they should seek medical attention immediately and use other methods of other methods of drug consum- consumption such as smoking instead of injecting. Just thinking about doing this makes me so nervous. I stammer. I mean, I just, I just, I just don't get it. You know, I, I've seen so many kids in meetings. You know, they've got track marks everywhere. I mean, they're shooting it between their fingers, between their toes, behind their ears, in their earlobes, into their neck, into their carotid artery. I don't get it. I, it's so sad to see somebody that destroyed. And the first question I ask myself is, what happened to that person that put them in so much psychological and emotional pain to make them want to do something that horrific to themselves, to hate themselves that much? Because that is, in my opinion, humble opinion, a form of self-abuse and self-hatred. At the same time, being an alcoholic and a drug addict, I understand the, the mindset and that you're running. You don't want to feel. You're going to do whatever the hell you can to not feel, not think, not remember whatever the hell plethora of nightmares that you have been through in your youth. But it just really is, it's just really sad. A person suffering from sepsis will appear unwell, pale, and disoriented. In some cases, of purses, a person will begin to go into shock, which is symptomatic of their body undergoing a massive toxic, toxic infection. Anyone suspected of having sep- sepsis, <laughs> sepsis should immediately seek medical treatment. The risk of sepsis damaging internal organs and causing death is very high. The treatment for sepsis is an aggressive treatment by doctors required to treat sepsis due to the life-threatening aspect of the condition. A patient will be given high doses of strong antibiotics to kill the toxic bacteria in the body. The site of the initial infection may be operated on and infected blood, pus, and tissue removed. In some cases, Patients will also have to be placed on a vaspirator to increase the blood pressure and strong painkillers and sedatives administered to treat pain. Patients may also require fluids to be administered, treatment in intensive care, and even dialysis to treat this condition. Adequate nutrition is also required to ensure a patient will fully recover. Now you sit there and you think of what I just said for a second. Opiates got them where they are. Now, because of this sickness that they have acquired and the condition coming from, stemming from their drug usage, they now have to have strong painkillers and sedatives administered to treat pain. So the cycle continues. Because if you've got a drug addict that's an opiate addict and you're giving them more opiates, then you know, you're running in place, but there's, you have no choice because of the pain level that they're in. It's incredible. I'm just very grateful I didn't have all that problem. I've got some information that were, was provided to me by the Claire Foundation. I'm just going to go over it with you. Unintentional overdose deaths from prescription pain meds more than quadrupled since 1999. More people died from drug overdose in 2014 than in any year on record. And the majority of these deaths, more than six out of 10 involved in opioid, I am sure that has increased dramatically, but dramatically, but statistics are always slow in coming in. Every day in the United States, 78 people die from an opioid related overdose every day, and 580 people start using heroin every day. And I'm sure that's increasing daily. The face of addiction has changed. 
Not just addicts in dark alleys with syringes, opioid addiction can start with adolescents getting wisdom teeth out and being prescribed medication that turns into abuse. Soccer moms and dads, pain meds after surgery, simplicity. $55 billion in health and social costs relating to prescription opioid abuse each year. $20 billion in emergency department and inpatient care for opioid poisonings. People losing their jobs, their homes, relationships, friends, and it leads to homelessness and separation of families. Now, I watched a 60 Minutes piece, a fusion piece, and a piece that was done by on Frontline on PBS, all about heroin. The piece that was on fusion was really interesting because it was talking about women that had come from upper middle class homes and had back injuries and had Oxycontin prescribed to them. They got hooked. The doctor cut them off. They went to the street. They started shooting heroin. Within a matter of months, their marriage is gone. They lose their children. They're living in shitholes, shooting galleries with people that are just destroyed in environments that would make you vomit if you saw it. And these are women that, you know, are that came from fantastic backgrounds, nice families, nothing seedy. And because of an injury and the doctors prescribing and over prescribing the medication to these poor women, they ended up junkies and losing everything. And when they were interviewed, what was interesting to me is the clarity level these women had. They're obviously educated. Most of these women had college degrees means nothing. Because when this thing gets a hold of you, it gets right into your soul and twists it. It's the most vicious drug I've ever seen. I thought cocaine was a monster, and it was a monster for me. And I'm very grateful that I got away from all that. And I thought that when I was in the middle of that hallway doing that stuff, that I was never going to get out of it. And I went to some very dark places and hung out with some very dark people that had dark souls that were completely lost. But this thing just takes families and really good people and just destroys them. The fusion piece also mentioned what was going on in Vermont, which is another mind blower. You wouldn't think there'd be a lot of junkies in Vermont, right? I mean, Vermont is, you know, uh, it's where you go to ski. It's you know, upper middle class and middle class and structured. And, you know, there's a uh, uh, God and churches and schools. And, you know, you don't think that, you know, wouldn't equate that, that with, you know, Vermont. Well, it's, it's really just as bad as the aforementioned story I just talked to you about. They did an interview with this fellow who had been a college professor had an upper middle class home, beautiful home, brick home, beautiful. I mean, just, you know, it's the American dream, normal. You look at it and you're thinking modern day, leave it to Beaver. And this poor fucker, and I can't, I, I, he just, he's just slamming drugs into his arms. Bing, 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 bing. Why? Because he had a car wreck and he had Oxycontin and he had some other medley of opiates prescribed to him. Couldn't get them anymore because the doctor went, nope. No, no, you're becoming addicted. So he gets a judgment call from the guy that gets him addicted and he gets booted out of the street. And the next thing you know, he's hammering drugs in his arms. And there goes the wife. There goes the kids. There goes the house. There goes the job. There goes the credibility. There goes the self-esteem. There goes the self-worth. And the guy's in, you know, flop house. And then he gets uh, his act together for a little while and, He's doing the program, and then he looks around and sees that he has nothing. His wife won't talk to him. His kids won't talk to him. His, his colleagues, his friends, they've all abandoned him. They've marked him a lost man. They've marked him a drug addict, someone that is a plague of society, and we all know that's crap. Your infrastructure, the people that supposedly love you and care about you, are the only things that are going to keep you alive. I didn't have that. I had me and I had God and I walked in and I decided, well, it's not them that's the problem. It's Richard Thompson that's the problem. So I did something about it. I stood up and I refused to become a statistic. Now, I don't know where I get that inner strength from. It's a gift from God. 
because I see so many men and so many women that don't have it. They just they just don't have it. it, it they're, yeah, I don't know if it's because they're so beaten or they just don't have it. And they haven't had the experiences that some of us have had that have made us hard. And they just crumble and they just die. I've been to so many funerals since I got sober. I mean, I lost count by year six. I'd already been to at least 45. And these kids would come in and they would just, you know, they just they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. They were too sick. They just something about the dope and the booze and the and the pain. It just psychically twisted them to the point where they just could not wrap their heads around any possibility of a way out of where they were, that anything could change, that they could change. Life could get better. They could actually be happy. And you go to these funerals and you see these young people laying in these caskets and you just you're grateful it's not you. And you look at their families and their families are destroyed. I mean, just destroyed. Kids destroyed because they, you know, they had to watch their mother or father go from being a viable, uh, healthy human being with all this vitality and all of this love and all of this passion to this shell of a human animal, which is what you're reduced to. And finally, they have to sit there and look at them in a casket, knowing that they'll never see these people again. They'll never feel the love of their mother and father. The medical profession is in fact over prescribing more than 650,000 opiate prescriptions a day are being written four and five new heroin users start out by misusing those prescription drugs when they can't afford the prescription or medication or they get cut off by the doctor well the heroin is obviously the cheap alternative prescription drugs are believed to be safer than street drugs 42 percent of teens believe it's safer to get high using prescription drugs than with illicit drugs associated with needles and dark alleys There has to be greater social acceptability for using medications for different purposes. Aggressive marketing by these pharmaceutical companies, being that in in the U.S. is their biggest consumer. That's why, you know, they aren't, you see all these stupid drug commercials that are so ridiculous. Just on the after, you sit there almost laugh after you've seen about 15 of them because the side effects are just so ridiculous. Like why in the hell would you even take it in the first place when any possible scenario of horrific nature could happen to your body after you take it but they don't do that with the opiates they don't have those because it's death and so they try to be quiet about it and they just give it to you while you're in the room the doctors know what the alternative is going to be they just know but the one thing that i can tell you for a fact is i used to go out with a girl that worked for pfizer she was a salesperson this was years ago in dallas and they used to take these doctors out to these five-star restaurants, Morton's, um, these huge steakhouses in Dallas, and, you know, spend like three grand on dinner. And then uh, a person from the drug company would do a pitch to introduce a new drug for the doctors to prescribe. And there was always little envelopes that looked like cards in them. And I asked her, what's in the cards? She said, plane tickets, cash, motivation to prescribe drugs to people that have no clue of what they're walking into. They just think that, well, I can trust the doctor. The doctor's not going to hurt me. That's why they're here. They're doctors. They have my best interests at heart. Well, I'm not saying that's not true. Of course, there are great doctors out there that help a lot of people, but there are also the parasitic types that attend these dinners and they accept those cards. And they, by the way, we were all ridden around in 16 passenger chauffeured limousines when we went to these things. That's just one isolated incident that I've had direct knowledge of. That's just right there and just enough to make you just scream. Those are the things that you see. What are the things that you don't see? Because that's where my mind goes. Not a laughing matter, but, you know. What is needed is greater accessibility to effective treatment. Addiction is costly. Treatment shouldn't be. Government funding to reflect the need and offset the cost. As we have seen, homelessness increased, funding decreased. So if you are opioid dependent and homeless, you're screwed. There should be more drug court programs for treatment and IOP aftercare treatment instead of incarceration for drug offenders. I think that the feds 
should make the drug manufacturers pay for the treatment. That in itself would probably motivate them to find an alternative way to treat pain versus narcotics. Alternative strategies for managing pain. People addicted to pain medication often do, in fact, have real pain. Yeah, that's true. They usually do. And then something else happens. They get hooked. So here, what can you possibly do to have any minimal effect on the flow of what's transpiring? One, you got to use your common sense. You clean out your medicine cabinet. 60% of these kids that get these opioids get them from somebody they know. So don't be that someone. If you've got class A narcotics in your house or class B, then you should keep them in a safe, locked away. I mean, literally. I mean, what the hell is it going to cost $100 to go get some safe at Office Depot and you put all the class A narcotics in there? Anything that's going to harm any child by any way, size, shape, or form should not even be anywhere out in the open. Just my opinion. It's prudent to understand the impact of the trauma. If you see someone struggling with trauma or addiction, you help them seek out treatment facilities and get professional help. There is strong correlation between trauma and SUD. Make sure as you're researching treatment options that you choose a place that is qualified staff to attend the trauma. And of course, the common sense aspect to parents, you talk to your kids and talk to other parents. Maybe even you guys get together in someone's house And spend a few hours talking to each other, putting it on the table, not keeping it the dirty secret that's in the closet, because that's how people start dying. Make sure as you're researching treatment options that you choose a place that is qualified staff to attend a trauma. Might be even prudent to have the kids and the parents and the friends to sign an abstinence pact in parents agree to remove all alcohol and drugs from their homes when parents are not present. When kids come to their houses to hang out. Just a thought. And now a word from my sponsor. Let's get into the problem of injecting drugs. Injecting drugs carries a very high risk of health problems. Disease are easily contracted, spread, and transmitted to others. Abscesses, ulcers, and other infections are frequent. And tolerance and dependence to a drug happens easier for intravenous drug users. The additional problems of unknown quality adulterant substances and impurities can also contribute to health problems. Serious efforts by governments and health workers is being done to reduce the risk associated with injecting drugs, which includes providing accurate and concise information about injecting drugs. Injecting an illicit substance into any site on the body can have dire consequences. But there are especially some serious risks associated with particular spots. Injecting into the neck, the hands, the feet, and the groin can cause major long-term damage. These injection sites are also prone to developing sepsis more rapidly. Femoral injection is the process whereby an intervenous, intervenous drug user excuse me, injects into the femoral vein, which is located in the groin. This vein takes blood from the legs to the heart, and injecting it into it is incredibly risky. The femoral vein is very close to the femoral artery, which is the main supply route of blood from the heart to the lower limbs and the femoral nerve. If a user injects into the femoral artery instead of at the vein, they will experience intense bleeding and without proper medical attention may suffer significant blood loss. Hitting the femoral nerve can cause a person to experience severe pain and permanent damage to their legs. Injecting into this site increases the risk of contracting deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolsis, and abscesses. Injecting into the hands or feet can potentially lead to many long-term problems such as reduced circulation and gangrene. Feet and hands contain delicate veins and nerve endings that can be easily damaged by over-injecting at the site of the inex- or inexperience. Additionally, the hands and feet are sites that are exposed to dirt, bacteria, and infections more than other parts of the body, so extra care should be taken. Or you can just not do it. Well, there's that. Just a thought. Sadly, injecting drug users are considered to be the most discriminated and marginalized of all drug users. Often, they are the victim of police brutality, harassment, and substandard medical care. They are also likely to avoid legal authorities, health workers, and others who may offer assistance because they're scared. This can lead to very serious physical, personal, and emotional problems for the drug user who may require intervention, but is too afraid to seek it out. Long-term and permanent damage can result from this marginalization. It's just grim all the way around, isn't it? Can you imagine being one of those poor people, having to wake up to that nightmare every day, afraid to tell anybody? You know, it's just, um, 
it's just crazy. My general understanding of what treatment providers do and my experience in dealing with them is they have programs which are residential outpayment and sober, outpatient and sober living prevention programs to schools, counseling for parents and adolescents, subacute clinically monitored detox facilities being added as well. There are facilities such as the Villa Hills Treatment Center, which is a for-profit center, and Claire Foundation that works to make treatment affordable for those who do not have great insurance. Although most treatment centers are in network and take most insurance and work out financial plans if needed. I've never met, in my experience, anybody that has a treatment center that, look, if the person is really willing to change and they can tell it by looking in their eyes that they're going to say no, they'll figure a way to scholarship it. And for those people that don't have any money and they don't have any insurance here's how you do it maybe not the most ethical thing i'm ever going to say but i really don't care because it's going to save somebody's life if you need to detox and you're going into dts or you're in trouble because you can't get any dope you walk into a hospital emergency room you grab your arm and you tell them you're thinking you're having a heart attack period and you're going to die they have to treat you they have to admit you that's the law once you're in then they ask you the rundown of the medical questions, you're going to tell them you're a drug addict and alcoholic. They have to detox you. That's how you get it done for free. I don't even care if I get sued. I'd rather see somebody stay alive than somebody die. That's why I'm here. Obviously, I'm not making any money doing this, so that's pretty much why I'm here. Please understand in no uncertain terms that I want to state that there is no such thing as a one-stop shop. Any treatment center that says they can handle every disorder that's out there, they're in over their heads. There's no way they can do it. You've got to go to specified places. This is how people die, and they do die, because they're not going to the right facilities that, that have expertise in that one addiction, that one problem area that they need desperate help with. Providers need to collaborate with other providers that have the expertise in these areas, such as eating disorders, sexual disorders, emotional disorders, psychological disorders incorporated with the opioid usage scenario. It's unbelievable when you get into this. You know, the more that I do this, the more that I learn. And, you know, you know I'm not some professional announcer. Yeah, that's, that's really obvious. But I talk from my heart, and there's no bullshit. Because I watch people die. I see kids every day at meetings. And they're scared to death. And there's so much peer pressure, even in the nucleus of recovery, that they're afraid to really say what they feel. They don't want to look bad. That ego is still there. And that's a killer. And because of that fear, and because they want to be with the cool kids, it costs them their life. And sometimes it just makes them suffer more until they realize that they don't need to be with the cool kids because the cool kids are probably the dumbest ones in the room. And that even goes into the adults as well in some of the meetings I've been to where they all have their little private parties. You know, the rich ones, the people that have money, and they invite all their friends that they let in. I've been laughing at this for years. I don't give a shit if anybody likes me or not. I really don't. I'm here to save my life, and I've done that. I'm here to help another alcoholic and a drug addict not die and give away what was given to me, this gift, and everything else is crap. It's complete horseshit. I should probably come in here and do this by myself more often. But you can't voice this kind of an opinion in the room because people, you know, when you start calling them on their behavior as a group, they don't dig it. But then again, a lot of people know I could care less if I'm involved in any other group outside of Alcoholics Anonymous or whatever else that I may be into. And yes, I talk about it. And they, it's, they say it's part of the traditions that you shouldn't talk about it. Well, you know why I talk about it? Because it saved my life. And I don't care if anybody likes it or not. If you're a drunk and you can't stop drinking, if you can't stop getting high, go to an AA meeting because it's the only thing that saved my life. And this is life and death. I don't care about how it looks. I care about how it is. Because how it is, is if you don't change and you don't stop, you, you don't even know what the hell you're doing here. You have no clue as to what you're doing here. And you're, if you don't even know yourself, then your entire time on this planet has been a complete and absolute waste. What I've learned since I came in this place, I found out who I was. I, I actually got to meet Richard Lynn Thompson. And you know what? I found out he wasn't a piece of garbage. 
He wasn't stupid. He wasn't ugly. He was a good man. And all of those people that said all of those things that I bought into, they were all wrong. And I look in the mirror every day, and I'm okay with the guy I look at today. I'm not rich. I didn't make it in the concert business like I wanted to. I didn't set the world on fire. And that's okay. But what I did do is I went from a middle-class background to the streets on my own choice because I knew I had to learn about life because nobody cared about me enough to sit me down and teach me anything. And I learned the concert business from the ground up. Never went to school one day to learn business. I taught myself business. I taught myself the concert business. I didn't have a mentor. I had a bunch of idiots around me, but I never had a real mentor. And I watched a bunch of guys who were really smart. They were in great situations, just be criminals. And I watched what not to do and learn from that. I've traveled around the world and I've flown around the world first class. And I did it in 15 days. And somebody else paid for it. I've worked with the biggest acts in the world. And I'm not saying this to pump myself up. This isn't about ego. This is about where I came from and where I'm at and what I've been through. Now, look, man, if I can do this, anybody can do it. You can change. Everybody's going to make mistakes. You're always going to run into the wall. And sometimes you've got to run into that wall 15, 20 times before you go, damn, that hurts. I don't want to do this anymore. This isn't working. So you stop. I did. Take a breath. Take a look at the behavior patterns of what the hell I was doing and stop it. Quit it. And not worry about what anybody else thinks. The only thing that matters to me in my life is that I can get up in the morning and I know that I haven't had a drink or a drug in over 23 years. I cannot even wrap my head around that completely. Honest to God, I can't because that is so much time I can't fathom that I've done this. This is the only thing in my life that I have done 100% correctly. And I did it with the help of God. Now, I am not a guy, anybody that knows me, knows that I don't go running in and out of church like my ass is on fire, right? I don't, I'm, that's not who I am, but I pray every single day. And I pray sometimes two or three and four times a day, not just for myself, but for other people. Because the only reason I'm sitting here is because of God. That's it. I've had angels around me all my life with some of the stupid shit that I used to pull. It's, there's no reason I should be here. None. But the reason I'm here is because I'm here to help other people. I pay for this radio station time out of my pocket. No one's paying for anything. The spots that I run that you hear for the Vela Treatment Center, I do it for nothing. Because the woman that runs it and owns it, Georgia Forboda, is a really good person and she gives a shit. It's not all about the money to her. And I respect her. She's a good person. Sometimes you just got to do the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing. And whatever falls out, falls out. And within that, you start growing up and you start making adult decisions. You start seeing situations in your life that are unacceptable. May it be a, a relationship, a business relationship or whatever. And you have to remove those people out of your life. Because you have self-esteem. Because you are a good person. Because you are not a doormat. It's an incredible program. I wish everybody in this world could work the steps one time, just once. The effect that would have on the human psyche of this planet would be unbelievable. I'm here to tell you that everything's fixable. And you don't have to shoot drugs into your arms. You don't have to go buy another eight ball. You don't have to go to the store and get another fifth and sit there and get high and be miserable, live in blackness. Because everybody knows your heart's broken. That's why you're doing it. That's why I did it. My heart was shattered. I thought I was a piece of shit, but I'm not. And now we're going to talk about rehab mogul scumbag of the universe, Chris Batham. If you haven't heard about this individual, special guy, likes himself a great deal. He's facing lawsuits alleging drug use and sexual battery of clients in his sober living houses. This is from a story That was in L.A. Weekly by Hilaire Aaron on April 25th, 2016. Chris Batham, the founder and board chairman of a chain of more than 20 sober living houses and outpatient clinics in California and Colorado, and the subject of a December L.A. Weekly cover story, has been sued three times in the past three months for allegations ranging from wrongful termination to sexual, sexual battery. The most recent lawsuit filed two weeks ago by a pair of former patients 
at one of Batham's Community Recovery Los Angeles facilities alleges that Batham isolated and targeted the plaintiffs and other women to prey on their addictions by using and supplying drugs around them, moving them to isolated hotel rooms and remote locations, encouraging them to use drugs with him and sexually molesting them when they were high and or incapable of consent. Before this, man, I thought I'd heard it all. I thought I'd see, I'd met every scumbag grease ball that you could possibly ever run into in your lifetime and have the displeasure of doing so. But no, I was wrong. LA Weekly's December story outlined multiple allegations against Batham that his embattled drug hab re, rehab empire was going to collapse because of investigations from multiple state and federal agencies. Batham has denied nearly every charge leveled against him. 2020 did a piece on him a few weeks ago. And I was sitting there with a friend of mine, Jennifer, and we're watching this guy. And he couldn't look this cat in the eye that was interviewing him. No way. And he was looking around and he was just blah, 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 a justification for every single thing he did. A friend of mine, Alan Schimmel, who is a very brilliant attorney, is representing the five plaintiffs that are allegedly accusing him of doing this alleged thing. And I don't, how evil do you have to be to create a environment that's supposed to be safe for people to come to not die. And then these poor girls come in, beat up, used up, broken. God only knows what nightmare that they've been through. And they come there just hoping that they'll be safe. And then this guy manipulates these girls, looks for the weakest one, finds what their buttons are, pushes the buttons, Cons them into getting high and then, in my opinion, rapes them. If a girl's lit and she doesn't know what's going on and she's emotionally been manipulated and she's intoxicated, she can't possibly give a legal consent to sex. Especially when the guy that's doing the number on her is the guy that owns the facility. I don't understand why this guy's still running around breathing. And I hope that he hears this and son of a bitch sues me because I could use the PR. <laughs> That'd be fine. In my opinion, what I would like to do, if this guy actually did this, because I don't have any proof in front of me, generically, anybody that does something like that and they are proven to be that kind of a scumbag, dig a hole. And I do this. I, I, have, this, I have the same mindset with child molesters. Dig a hole, give me a gun, I blow their brains out, kick them in the hole, cover them up. Next. That's really where I'm at. Because there's just no time and no room for this kind of crap. When you've got people coming to a place where that it's the last place on the block that they're going to come. They don't have any place else to go. What the hell are they going to do? They're trying to not die. They're trying to stay alive. They're looking for one decent human being. One. Just one. Doesn't have to be a lot of them, just one. And then they run into this piece of shit. And everybody's covering for him. All of his staff is covering for them because the word that I got is that he was paying out so much cash, they were making more money than any other place they could have gone. So addicts that are trying to work with addicts are selling out the addicts for nickels and dimes. Obviously, I'm a little passionate about this. Usually, I've got somebody here. There's a flow going on. Sounds a little bit more professional. But tonight, I don't really care. I was supposed to sit here by myself and just do my thing. So I'm doing my thing. So you may like what I said. You may not like what I said. That's fine. But I speak from my heart. And my wish and my goal is that anybody that's sitting out there suffering that may be listening to this right now, just give yourself a chance. Just make the phone call. Just make the phone call. Don't think about it. Just make the phone call and try and get some help. Just call somebody and say, I'm dying. I'm injecting drugs. I'm smoking cocaine. I'm drinking too much. I've got a sexual addiction. I've got a food addiction. I've got a, uh, a gambling addiction. Just tell somebody. Nobody's going to look at you and judge you because the things that they've done are probably a hell of a lot worse than yours. Trust me on that one. I would like to thank you for those who are still on <laughs> listening to me for staying on and listening to the broadcast this evening. We're at the end of this week's show, but make sure to tune in next week for another hour of Brutally Honest Recovery Talk Radio. My, my mission 
is to provide a safe platform for those who are suffering from various forms of addiction. I'm just a guy willing to listen and offer suggestions to help those in crises. You know, I'm just a drug addict and an alcoholic, but I want you to know that I'm here for you 24 hours a day, and I love you. And now we will leave you with the wisdom of the late, great John Flynn. Disappointment. Disappointment is the caboose on the tootsie train of expectation. Anything you want from anybody, you give them what you want from them. It's the only way you're going to get it. Life is about giving, not getting. Day at a time. Thank you, John. And thanks a lot for listening. Good night and good luck. You're listening to Life Repair Recovery Talk Radio with Rick Thompson only on L.A. Talk Radio.